God, Mom! This came so fast, it took out houses and cars and everything in the blink of an eye. Get out of here, go! I've never experienced anything like this happening to such a grand scale. It came as a battering ram that was four, five, six feet high at 30 miles an hour. Seemed like half the mountain came down. We've always had extreme weather, but over the last 20 years, as climate change has accelerated, it has mutated and become more dangerous and unpredictable. Whoa! From dry lightning to the polar vortex to bomb cyclones and the fire nado. Welcome to the new reality. Welcome to mutant weather. As the climate changes, the structure of the very Earth beneath our feet is changing too, becoming unstable. We have earthquakes, tsunamis, landslides, floods. Even climate change itself can be considered a hazard. Um, and what we're seeing is a change in the frequency and magnitude of some of those hazards. When a warming Earth becomes destabilized, the land we rely on is compromised, affecting landslides, sinkholes, and mudslides. In Europe, Asia, and the Americas. Every part of this planet is recording different kinds of changes that are associated with climate change right now. For 200 years, humanity has burned fossil fuels for energy, releasing chemicals into the atmosphere that had been trapped in the Earth for millions of years, fundamentally changing both the atmosphere and the geosphere. So in a very short period of time, human climate change has influence these systems on the scale of geologic change that would normally take millions of years to occur. Moving carbon from the Earth to the atmosphere traps more and more heat. And as the planet heats up, it triggers unexpected chains of events. The geosphere and the atmosphere are linked, of course, because the solid Earth uh, is covered by the gases that form the atmosphere and that, that we rely on for life. The atmosphere weathers earth materials, um, changes the composition of materials at the surface, and that affects the entire geosphere. Supercharged storms drop more water saturating hillsides until they collapse. Glaciers that have subdued volcanoes for thousands of years begin to melt. Underground torrents of water erode the earth until it collapses. As extreme rainfall is becoming much more likely. We're seeing big changes in the probability of extreme rainfall. And extreme rainfall is one of the major triggers of mudslides and landslides. Montecito, California, a wealthy community where Marco Farrell and his family lives. They have already begun to feel the effects of climate change. We had six, seven years of a pretty, pretty devastating drought here. To begin with, we live in a semi-arid desert. The hills were just absolutely tinder dry. In early December 2017, when a fire started. And we got the big fire, big fire right there. <laughs> Fires today are hotter than they've ever been. They're bigger than they've been, and they're burning more deeply into the ground. Santa Barbara and Ventura County had experienced one of the the largest fires in California history. Mark Hall has been a member of the all-volunteer Santa Barbara Swiftwater Search and Rescue Team for five years. A fire of that proportion and burning that large and that hot completely destroys all vegetation. It goes so fast and so hot that there's nothing that is in its way that doesn't burn to the ground. And the chaparral, which is the, the plants that grow on our foothills here, have a lot of oil in them. And it vaporized that oil, and that oil then fell back down onto the ash and created a hydrophobic surface layer. So water didn't penetrate it at all. It actually would beat up. Fires transform the surface 
of the burned ground and create a layer at or just below the surface that actually repels water. In many areas after a wildfire, you get a very high runoff that occurs because the water cannot penetrate this hydrophobic layer and the underlying soil. All that water has to go somewhere, and if it falls on steep slopes, it will typically run down stream courses and erode material and trigger failures that then become uh, debris flows. After the fire, the Office of Emergency Services and other first responders held several town hall meetings and press conferences to try to educate our community as to what dangers lay above us as we entered into our storm season. On January 8th, a heavy band of moisture approaches Montecito saw the storm develop and march towards us, and we knew that there was a significant chance for very, very heavy rainfall. It was probably one of the largest storms that we had seen in years. So the day of January 8th, we had evacuated much of uh, Montecito. Uh, some people think that they're safer in their own home and have been through enough of these that they think that they can survive. So it puts first responders in, in harm's way and it also puts um, the, the public in harm's way when they don't heed these uh, evacuations. Marco Farrell and his family are among the residents who decide to stay in their own home despite the approaching storm. People were exhausted. They'd evacuated some three, four, five times. It's just emotionally and physically exhausting. The storm didn't come at 10 o'clock as expected. We waited and waited. I went to sleep and laid out my, my rain gear and my boots just so that I could roll right out of bed and, and right into them and, and, and go, go to action if, if I needed to. And I really, in my head, was preparing for battle. About 3 o'clock in the morning, the rain started coming. And they came as hard as I've ever seen it. It was like being in a car wash. I've never seen that much rain come down uh, that heavily. We've got two factors coming together. More water coming down over shorter periods of time, hitting a landmass that has less capability to absorb it or handle it, and it runs off very quickly. I woke up to the most horrendous rain I'd ever heard. I went out, opened the front door, and it was dark, a lot of rain, but not as much water in the street as I expected to see. And we all of a sudden heard a gigantic explosion and a flash of light uh, up on the hillside. And it was very strange seeing a fire in the middle of pouring rain, and we couldn't figure out what was going on. When I walked back out front, there's all of a sudden this incredibly brilliant orange light couldn't figure out why the sun was coming up there two hours it was before it was supposed to come up there. It just didn't make sense. Virtually everyone in Montecito sees the fireball blazing in the sky, but no one knows what it is. I was awoken by my roommate in the room who said there's a giant fireball in the sky. Andy Rupp, a paramedic with the Montecito Fire Department, has lived in Southern California for his whole life. We went out, we tried to make access across the district to this fireball in the sky. Mike, get in the car. And we saw mud coming down the streets that we were trying to pass. We thought there was a lot of rain that was causing mud coming off the hillside and going down the streets. A friend of mine called and said, hey, I'm coming to pick you up. There's a fire in the hills. And I said, I'm on my way. I was about three blocks away, and then there was big noise. I turned and ran as fast as I could. I fled for my life, yelling, flash flood, flash flood, flash flood. It isn't a flash flood. It's much worse. It's the debris flow. A debris flow is a fast-moving, uh, highly fluid, uh, water-rich uh, flow of material down a slope, and by definition would have larger 
uh, material within it. So it could have uh, big boulders, uh, mud, sand, uh, tree stems. We knew exactly where the flame was coming from and we tried to make it up to that area. Mark heads towards the high pressure gas line, which is the source of the fireball. But every single road that we came across, there were either downed trees or power lines that kept us from being able to get through. And that's when we ran into the active debris flows. There were window high on our vehicles, which would be about four feet deep. In them, you could see giant logs, trees, pieces of homes flowing through. It was a sea of mud. As I got to the house and I pulled out my phone to start to try to film it, it was a, a whole line of logs and, 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 and boulders and cars and debris and just, just macerating its way down the street. And I'd totally forgotten that my friend was, was coming up to, to pick me up. And I looked down the street and I see his headlights. And I go, oh, no. Oh, no. And I could hear it getting louder and louder. Turn around. Get out of here. Go. Oh, my God, Mom. Close the door. Get, get, get ready to go out. Pick that up. In the Pacific Ranges in British Columbia, Canada, the melting ice cover on top of volcanoes like Mount Meager poses a unique threat. Mount Meager hasn't erupted for 2,400 years, but scientists have observed toxic gas belching from holes in the shrinking glacier cap. The key thing about most volcanoes is they spend most of their life falling down. And Mount Meager is a case in point. We can see every year that the glacier is melting back and how that meltwater starts to interact with this already rotten rock because of those volcanic gases. That is starting to make, we believe, the mountain more unstable. In 2010, 50 million cubic meters of material thundered down Mount Meager's slopes, the largest such event in recorded Canadian history and the next one could be even worse. Our interest in right now for any future activity is how the glaciers and the water on the mountain are changing. The pore space, spaces between the grains of sand and rock, that can make things expand and make that rock weak. And if it's too weak, eventually gravity will be that final trigger that pulls the mountain down. Possibly, if we had a massive landslide, much, much bigger than in 2010, could it even destabilize the magma system underneath and lead to a volcanic eruption? So climate is playing a role on destabilizing this volcano. In Land O'Lakes, Florida, a region known as Sinkhole Alley, cracks that appear in drywall or a suddenly crooked step may be the only warning before the earth opens up to swallow cars, homes, and even people. Florida is the sinkhole capital of the world. We're also the sinkhole capital of, of Florida. We have more sinkholes in Pasco County than any other county throughout the state. Sinkholes occur in areas where we have soluble rocks. Much of Florida is underlain by limestone, and limestone is a soluble rock, so at depth, uh, below the surface, you've got water that's, I would argue, so almost eating away at the limestone and producing caverns at depth. And over time, you eventually reach a point where the ground left's unsupported to the point where it actually collapses. So you get the ground collapsing above one of these uh, open cavities. Andrew Fossa, the director of emergency services for Pasco County, is on the ground the day that a massive sinkhole swallows two homes in Land O'Lakes. As climate change creates more powerful rainstorms, the increased water flow can erode the earth in the region until the ground suddenly opens up. Lake Paget was a giant lake. Then they decided to build a community over it, so they brought in fill and they packed it down, brought in fill, and started taking portions of that lake away to the point they built a residential section on it. 
it's very hard to convince people to not build there when they've never seen water there. They never expect to see water there, but they don't realize the dynamic in the system has now changed. Mother Nature will take back what you have taken from it. So that lake, having an aquifer underneath it being fed, that eventually starts to erode away. And Mother Nature is going to start taking that back. So that compacted soil is not natural earth soil. It was put in there. So it starts eroding away underneath to the point that a sinkhole forms. July 14th, 2017. A normal day begins in Lando Lakes, Florida. As the community prepares to go to work for the day, an unusual dip in the turf foreshadows the destruction to come. Doors started to not shut. Um, cracks in the walls started appearing. The garage door was coming off its hinges and there was a, some huge cracks in the floor that we were noticing. We could feel them even underneath the carpet. Fire rescue got a call out there for ground movement for a depression. And as they were pulling up, the crew actually witnessed the ground settling in. The resident that called them in, they went over to the house, they're knocking on the door, and they could physically hear the house cracking. The scary thing about sinkholes is they occur unexpectedly, very rapidly, and uh, without warning. We never imagined that something like this would happen anywhere, even close to us. It was pretty scary. I mean, the road was collapsing right in front of us. This house in front of us over here, we were watching everything just kind of get eaten by Mother Nature. It was, it was intense. In Montecito, California, the debris flow reaches Marco Farrell. He barely makes it home to warn his parents about the wave of mud that's smashing through his community. I went, checked the front door right as this huge wall of debris hit, hit our house. And it sounded like a, a, a huge dump truck just sloshed a huge thing of pancake batter. It was just this wet, really wet, heavy sound to it. And the kitchen door breached. That was the scariest part for me. It was just the most horrendous, violent noise. And instantly, it was knee high everywhere, mud, and it was rising. In the kitchen, it was counter height. There's nothing I could do. I'm sorry, you guys. And the whole house was shaking. It was getting hit by boulders. Everyone stay calm. We've tried to make access to this fireball in the sky, and we weren't able to. And now we've got a call for a woman who was trapped behind a security gate on someone's yard. Dylan, go ahead. When we arrived to the lady, she was covered head to toe in mud. You know, I was thinking, OK, here, here we go. This is, this is what they talked about. We'll see what sort of devastation we have. And she was the most emotionally distressed I've ever seen someone. It was odd, and it was unnerving. In Land Lakes, Florida, a subterranean void grows. Andrew Foss's team scrambles to save as much as they can as it swallows everything above it. The crew went above and beyond and actually went back in the house as the house started to collapse and grabbed keys, important documents for them, and it was able to move an RV, a boat, their cars, and probably about 15 minutes after that, the ground gave away on that house. As that hole started to grow, it started moving over, and then the whole center just fell out from underneath them. Florida is dominantly underlain by limestones. It's a very common area for sinkholes. It's not the only area. There's limestones all through um, kind of the Midwestern and Eastern US and even into Canada. It was pretty scary. I've never seen anything like it before. Watching the road crumble away, watching the house, just it was loud. There was a lot of noises. You wouldn't think so, but it was pretty loud. Neighbor had a pool, not one next to us, but the one next to them had a pool. We saw that go down. The hot tub went down. Cars, boats, bedroom set, furniture, belongings, part of a house are all sitting in the bottom of that sinkhole. In fact, there's actually a Corvette that was valued over $100,000 that was a collector item. Extreme events in terms of precipitation are what we'd worry about. 
The more rain that we get, the more depression calls we get. Right now, we just had two weeks of rainy periods. We've had a total of 44 sinkhole calls. In Montecito, California, the debris flow spreads. Emergency services begin to see how enormous the devastation is. I'm right through it. What are we supposed to do? Oh, a transit is about late. Okay, I'm so sorry. Your phone's cutting in and out. What is going on at the address? Well, the house is about to be lost. Where you need help? The radio started going off with all the dispatch calls for people calling in needing assistance. You need to come to our house. Our house is filled with mud. I have a newborn. We understand that. We're going to die. We'd be up to our necks in mud if we tried to get off our bed. I don't know if we're going to live. Come on, come on. In September 2018, Sulawesi, Indonesia is devastated by a 7.5 magnitude earthquake. Uh, earthquake is a result of a sudden movement of two blocks of the crust of the earth uh, against one another. The quake triggers a tsunami and the largest soil liquefaction event ever recorded. 4,300 are killed, over 10,000 are injured, and hundreds of thousands lose their entire communities. Soil liquefaction is a phenomenon that often accompanies earthquakes, and uh, it is a transformation of a solid soil material into a liquid. Uh, that can break foundations or cause buildings to tilt. It's one of the big destructive phenomena that accompany earthquakes. In Montecito, California, as a torrent of mud and debris pummels Marco's home, got it free for everyone here. he does what he can to protect his family. This is literally as high as the kitchen counters. I was feeling the whole house was shuddering when these big rocks and, and tree trunks were hitting it. Stay there. You guys stay there. We sheltered in place in this very small um, hallway. I'm going to try to open that door over there. I barely beat it to our back door, and I opened the back door. We literally have a torrent of mud going through the house. And that ended up saving our lives. I don't know why I acted the way I did, but it was just pure instinct at that point. It's gone down six inches. <laughs> Once we came down onto the Olive Mill Hot Springs area, that we found homes that were destroyed, we found cars that were flipped over, we found boulders, tree trunks. We found the debris and the chaos. We started searching for people and had no idea if we were gonna find anyone that was still around that was alive. If this was just gonna be body recoveries, we weren't sure. It was really bad. In Lillooet, British Columbia, Probably all my life I've been interested in vintage cars. I got my Morgan in 1988 and uh, I've babied it ever since then. Glenn Sorco is a retired pilot. Now he has the time to indulge his passion for classic cars as one of the members of the Pacific Morgan Owners Group. In August 2018, the group is taking a scenic drive through rural British Columbia led by Glenn's good friend, Tom Morris. When we left Vancouver, the weather that day, there was not a cloud in the sky. It was absolutely gorgeous. And of course, you get in the mountains, and the weather changes. On our way to Cache Creek, we hit the worst storm I think I've ever been in. It was like buckets of water thrown against the windshield. The hail was at least the size of my thumb. We're seeing an increase in precipitation in our warming climate in British Columbia. And if this uh, is accompanied by extreme events, uh, heavy rainfall events, then we're going to see a lot more debris flow activity. It got so bad that Tom couldn't see the center line of the road. And it was very, very dark. Your lights weren't doing any good whatsoever. When he stopped, I pulled up beside him 
and he said, I'm going to put the top up, and uh, I said, fine, I'll just go ahead and find a safe place. I don't know, 200 yards ahead of him, and uh, then I walked back to see him, and he says, I think we'll wait for the other cars. And uh, I just walked back to my car. When I got to it, just all hell broke loose. California. In Montecito, Andy Rupp battles impossible conditions during his rescue efforts. We tried to make access to a neighborhood that a couple of calls had come in from people stuck in their attics. The vehicle wasn't going to be able to make it because the mud was too deep and we couldn't see the road at all. I grabbed a ladder, carrying it on my shoulders, and started walking, you know, in down the road. And pretty soon I found out that I was in the mud up to the ladder. My captain said, well, what are you going to do when you get there? And I went, oh, yeah, good point. We can get up there and say hi, but then I'm not bringing him out through this mud, so they're probably safer in the attic than they are for us going in. From start to finish, the debris flow took only about 30 minutes. It was a very, very fast moving event. Boulders the size of SUVs were floating on top of the, the mud and debris. You could see four dozen cars stuck in the mud and not moving. Everywhere you looked, there was mud and debris covering everything and creating a new landscape. We didn't know that there were swimming pools around. That was a huge hazard. Uh, you could step into a pool and disappear, and no one would find you because of the mud. Debris flows actually can bulk up as it moves down a stream course. It can grow in size, become a monster that actually can travel uh, much farther than other types of landslides. Marco Farrell has been trapped in his home all night with his parents, fighting for survival. As time passed, it started raining again, and I really felt we needed to do something. We dodged the first wave. I felt that if there was a second wave, we wouldn't survive. It was uh, 5.40 or so, and, and the, the very first rays of light were starting to pop up in the east, and I knew, OK, this is go time, and went back in and, and brought my mom out and said, oh, OK, here we go. We're going to get somebody to, to help us. There were electrical power lines down all over the place. There were gas mains that were sheared off and hissing. They sound like jet engines. It was a massive, chaotic event that looked like a war zone. We had cars that were up on top of debris piles. We had still a, a river running through part of the area. You had huge boulders. You had trees down. We had a report from uh, two of our members that they found a woman who was on about a six-foot debris pile. She had some injuries to her legs and had some wires wrapped around her legs, but was conscious, knew what was going on. We ended up getting her onto a backboard, cutting her free of the wires, and carrying her a couple hundred yards up to where the ambulance could, could pick her up and take her into the hospital. She thought she lived across the road. She said she had three other family members with her and pointed across the way. Andy heads in the direction she indicates and finds another massive debris pile, hoping he can locate her family members. The debris pile was probably 75 feet long, 20 feet wide, 12 feet high, and had two vehicles that were up on top of it. So I climbed up on it, looked inside the vehicles with a flashlight, checked the cab, no one was in there, came down off the debris pile and was talking to Captain Hauser. He goes, did you hear that? Someone's calling for help. It's coming from this pile. Uh, and got down, listened underneath the top of a house had ripped off and was sitting on the pile. And sure enough, I could hear someone calling out. In 2017, as the citizens of Sierra Leone recover from a civil war, thousands built homes on Sugarloaf Mountain on the outskirts of Freetown. After weeks of three times the normal rainfall, an entire side of the mountain collapses, leaving more than 1,100 people dead or missing. 
anything in the path of a landslide of that size moving at that speed uh, would just be totally eradicated from the landscape. Um, the power uh, is, is huge. In a cruel irony, people already in deep poverty with virtually no carbon footprint are the most vulnerable to extreme weather. We see that all across the globe with countries that are likely to be most affected by climate change yet have very low carbon footprints. In Montecito, California, the search for survivors begins. Mark Hall's team looks for people who have been trapped by the massive debris flow that has swept over the town. We had just come out of the Montecito Creek debris flow area. We noticed that there was a light shining out of the vent of an attic and someone yelling, screaming for help. So that was literally where we started our, our rescues. We had to um, cut our way through a fence, swim through probably six feet of mud and debris in their backyard to, to get to the house. And it was a family of two adults and, and three children, including a newborn. We ended up cutting out one of the windows, rescuing that family out through the windows into some of our inflatables. Once we finished with the first family, we literally went door to door doing exactly the same thing. Across town, Andy Rupp races against time to save a young girl who is buried beneath a massive pile of debris. You know, so I asked how many uh, people were in there. She assured it was just herself. Uh, she said she didn't think she was injured. She had confirmed that she was that woman's daughter. And then it was a matter of trying to figure out how to get her out of this massive debris pile. There was a large tree that was down that was running up the debris pile. I went up that, was shining my light down into the pile. She couldn't see the light. And we just started pulling more and more debris off of there. So it was extremely difficult to find her because this debris pile is so big and there's so much mud in there. I can hear her, but I can't see her. I moved this tiny little tree branch and she said, ow. And I said, what are you saying ow to? She said, you've got my hair. And I looked carefully and I could see some hair going back to this big dirt ball. And I poked it with one finger and went, is this your head? And she said, yeah, it's my head. I went, oh, kind of a relief. Oh, I know where you are now. And then at the same point, oh, that's so much worse than I thought. <laughs> Lillooet, British Columbia. In the winding mountain roads, Glen Sorco's vintage car club encounters a sudden change in weather that delivers torrential rain. I heard the massive noise. All I had time to do was look around behind me and hang on to my car and try to deflect with my foot anything I could. The flow did not cease. The major onslaught was just a mass of like a tidal wave coming down or a dam busting. And then after that, there was just unbelievable amount of flow of water. Debris flows are high speed type of landslides and they can travel faster than you can run. They can move at 20, 30 uh, kilometers an hour, um, you know, twice as fast as a human can run. I had not let go of the car because the flow was that strong. I got the deflected force. Tom's car took the force and both Tom and his wife were washed away. As soon as I was safe, now it was to look for Tom and Val. And I went down, found him, and signaled to him I was going downriver to look for Val. And I went say, a kilometer down the river, and I just looked as far as I went, there was no chance she was going to be alive. Montecito, California. Three hours after the debris flow, Andy Rupp has located the young girl trapped under a pile of debris but one false move could crush her. So the mud that she was in came up to about her torso. So her face was within six inches of the mud. 
I thought then, you know, this is gonna be such a nightmare, right? Every time you move something, it could collapse in on her. We were fortunate that we had battery powered tools which used it to, to cut open cars. We couldn't use a chainsaw because of the, the gas link that was around, so we couldn't use anything that could ignite the gas. I had the handle and I started the throttle on it. She's been so great and so calm in there. And as I'm making that last cut, she starts to scream in pain. And then as soon as it cut through, there was this sigh of relief and you can see her moving around and I went, oh, I can't believe that that was it. She was able to climb right out and walk over to the gurney with some assistance. You know, physically seemed fine. The Swiss Alps, home to the Matterhorn, one of the most iconic mountains on the planet. But temperatures in the Alps are increasing twice as fast as the global average, which means these snow-capped peaks are literally melting before our eyes. The Alps have been suffering for the last few decades because of warmer and warmer winters and summers. They're not getting as much snowfall, um, and the summers, the snowfall is melting off faster. In the past, even 50 or 100 years ago, those high rock mountains like the Matterhorn would be frozen. Imagine that the ground is frozen year round. It's solidly frozen. And now the ice is, is thawing and melting and water is moving down into the joints and the cracks in the rock. And that is exerting pressures on the rock that lead them to uh, fail. When the Matterhorn's ice begins to fail, the mountain may become so destabilized that it could cause massive landslides. Montecito, California. As day breaks, residents begin to comprehend the scale of the devastation that has overtaken their community. This is one of the first moments to really stop and look around and see the devastation. The houses that are gone are, are completely gone and they're covered in mud. So the days that follow directly after the debris flow were challenging and I think mentally difficult on a lot of the rescue workers here. Turned into a body recovery. So we have dogs coming in that are cadaver dogs. You're looking for bodies and that's just, it's a mentally stressful thing that I've never had to do. And there were still two people that were never found. You can see the height of where the debris came up. In some places, it came up 30, 40 feet high. There were over a 1,000 homes destroyed and families that were displaced from their residences. Over the course of the next two to three days, many of them were helicoptered out of their residences because there was no one that could get there. There's always the concern that you would be either rescuing or recovering somebody that you knew. That's something that weighs heavy. It makes it hard. I go back, I get dad and, and our dog out, and right as the firemen pull up and I was able to get us onto the truck and evacuate us. Freeway, I, I looked back and there was the most brilliant rainbow over that line of clouds over Montecito. And that's when I knew, you know, we're, we, we survived this, we survived this. In Lillooet, British Columbia, the mudslide relents. Glenn Sorko is forced to abandon the search for his friend Val. He returns to help her husband, Tom. There was a big flow still and rocks and that going by me. I wanted to get to Tom. I went down, I got Tom over to a place we could get a rope to him and then pulled him up. My main job was warming him up, plus to talk and yell at him uh, to save him from going in a coma. We had people call the ambulance and the police and everybody got notified. While Tom is taken to the hospital, Glenn realizes that his car, battered by the debris flow, is his only way back to town. Police didn't want me anywhere near the car. They didn't want me to take the car. They said, you're on your own. So the whole way back, I said to my wife, it's the loneliest drive I have ever done in my life. 
Montecito, California, the site of the mysterious fireball. Mark Hall surveys the damage. This used to be the bridge that connected Park Lane with um, uh, the San Ysidro Inn. This was the flashpoint of the initial debris flow. We had a high tension gas line that went under the bridge that when the debris flow came down and took away the bridge, it exploded and blew up uh, these houses here. The level of the creek has been gouged out about 30 feet just from the force of the, of the rocks and debris. You can see some of the size of the boulders that came down. It was a very quiet, tranquil creek. Now what you see is a massive scar of where things have been literally uh, excavated out by rocks and debris. First scientists think of geologic time in terms of uh, how long the Earth has existed. We live an average of maybe 75 or 80 years. That's just a drop in the ocean of geologic time. A landscape formed over millions of years is utterly transformed in an instant. The survivors begin to dig out from the masses of Earth that have landed on them. It was awe-inspiring that the, the amount of of uh, destruction, total devastation that, that all of this debris had exacted on us. Had I to do this all over again, obviously I would heed the concerns and, and evacuate. I would also spend more time trying to warn our neighbors. We lost friends and we lost neighbors. I'm gonna be the one ringing the bell to get out, get out, get out, get out. As the ground beneath our feet reacts to the profound changes triggered by humanity, these landslides and sinkholes are just the beginning of major changes in the geosphere. We pay a price for our meddling with certain cycles. You got to be a little prepared when you live in California. Mother Nature is always going to rear her head every couple years or so often. And you can prepare to some degree, but you can't prepare for everything. So around the globe, we're actually seeing a big increase in the number of landslides and mudslides that are happening over the last couple of decades. Big ones, fatal ones, much more of them happening. And we're also seeing, in step with that, a lot more extreme rainfall at those locations that's triggering these events. It can let go at any time. And if you happen to be there, guess what? As the planet warms, we are changing the fundamentals of its geology. Continued thawing of permafrost increases the chance of large mudslides in the north. Intensified precipitation can trigger sinkholes and larger mudslides. And as the ice caps on mountains melt, the glue that holds these geological structures together is dissolving. Most terrifying of all, a potential collapse of the Greenland ice sheet could melt 684,000 cubic miles of ice into the ocean, triggering tsunamis, earthquakes, and volcanoes across the northern hemisphere, shifting the Earth's crust beneath a massive weight redistribution. We can actually have earthquakes triggered as a result of uh, the removal of snow and ice due to climate change. Nowhere on the planet is safe from the effects of mutant Earth. These geological processes have already begun, and they will continue for hundreds or even thousands of years. So people have actually talked about us living in the Anthropocene right now, humans' interaction on the geologic time scale. Every unit of CO2 that we put into the atmosphere changes the future of the planet on hundreds to thousands of years time frame. Most profound of all, the pace of these geological changes has accelerated. Processes that should take millions of years are now occurring in just decades. Climate change is affecting this, these systems so quickly that within a generation, we are having an imprint on these systems that is more than a geologic time change. And with things happening, so fast now and accelerating on an annual basis. We're not talking decades, we're talking every year things are accelerating faster than many scientists studying them could have even imagined. The change in climate that we're seeing is really rapid, much more rapid than we've seen in the geologic record. Um, it's not an esoteric problem. This is a real world hazard to people. As we move into the future, the climatic conditions just seem to be getting worse and worse. 
it's going to happen, and it's just a matter of uh, when and how, how badly it's going to happen. We live on mutant Earth now. The stability that humanity has relied on for thousands of years is gone, and we are just beginning to understand the mutations that our planet is undergoing. The geological instability we live with now will be a fact of life for thousands of years to come.